interview with Henry Roberts, former financial accountant with the Atomic Energy Commission in New Mexico, and also former football star with the Carlisle Indians in 1911. This interview is being held in Henry's home in Pawnee, Oklahoma on October the 2nd, 1972. Your interviewer is Robert Bish of the Jim Thorpe home in Yale, Oklahoma. Henry, would you begin our interview by telling us uh, something about your parents, your birth, and your early childhood? My parents were both members of the Pawnee Indian tribe, formerly of Nebraska and later of Oklahoma. I was born on, on a farm where we made our home near, Arkansas, near the Arkansas River in Pawnee County, Oklahoma. My mother passed away at the early age of 30 years, which left my father and a number of children. I uh, attended the Pawnee Indian Boarding School near the city of Pawnee as a young boy, possibly two or three years. I had a half-brother that uh, also attended the same school. We were almost the same age, my half-brother having been born in the month of February 1888 and I the following month of March 1888. My father took us from the Pawnee boarding school to Lawrence, Kansas and enrolled us there as students. That was in the month of March 1897. We were still quite young. We remained at Haskell for possibly three or four years, depending upon the fact that uh, it was necessary in those days for the parent to sign up for, for a period of years when enrolling their children there, according to federal government procedures. Then, I think we came home during the summer months for the vacation period. And then back to Haskell for another term of years. All in all, I was enrolled at Haskell Institute three or four times before I graduated there. My brother, in the meantime, having dropped out and entered the, entered the United States Army at the age of 18, I believe. As, uh, as I have stated, I, 
myself attended high school three or four different times. I finally graduated out of the high school business administration department in the spring of the year 1910. Okay, would you tell us a little bit about the your football days at Haskell? I played college football for Haskell Institute during the seasons of 1908 and 1909. I was captain of the 1909 team. We had uh, fairly hard schedules and uh, during the year or the season of 1909 we had on our schedule University of Nebraska and University of Texas Luckily, we defeated both of these teams that year. The margin of scores was small. During the years 19... 8 and 9 and 1910 I uh, matriculated in the uh, business administration course at high school. I completed the course in the spring of the year 1910 when I received my diploma. That was the last time I attended Haskell Institute. Speaking of Jim Thorpe, the great athlete. I first got acquainted with Jim at Haskell Institute. We were about eleven or twelve years of age. We, having been born pretty much the same period of time, I was born in the month of March, 1888, and Jim told me that he was born in the month of April, 1888. When I knew Jim, at this time, we were, of course, just young lads, and uh, were not engaged in any college football. Jim told me years later that uh, he did not remain at Haskell very long. He stated to me that uh, while he was there, he received a letter one day from home 
telling him that his father was quite ill. And uh, Jim, for that reason, wanted to request leave from the school to visit his father in the Sacken Fox country. But uh, his request to go and see his father was denied by the school authorities. So Jim took French leave and went to see went home to see his father. And I don't believe that Jim ever returned to Haskell. So the next time that I got to meet up with Jim Thorpe was in the fall of 1911. We met at the Carlisle Indian School and we played on the Carlisle team during the season of 1911. Jim, as I recall, played the left halfback position and I the left end position. Pop Warner was our coach. Carlisle always had uh, ready. Carlisle always had a pretty long schedule of football games. And during the season of 1911, we had, among other teams, Harvard University. We played Harvard near the end of the football season. And uh, that was a very hard game. We played Harvard on their home grounds, then known as the Harvard Stadium, near uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. As I recall, the evening newspapers in and around Boston and elsewhere were predicting a Harvard win because Harvard had a very strong team that year, having won every game, I believe, up to the time of our game. Of course, we knew that we had a pretty good team also, having won all games up to that time. The next day, When we played the game, Carlisle received the kickoff from Harvard. 
and to my surprise, we got through the team uh, and up to about the 10 yard line. I thought sure then that we were in for a quick touchdown, but that was not to be. In some manner or other, our ball carrier fumbled the ball and Harvard recovered. Of course, Harvard being a formidable team, were able to get out of danger by lying bucks and so on. See, there's just silicone. You know, it uh, goes on the floor in the rug. It sticks to everything. Dry air, waterproof and all. The game seesawed back and forth that afternoon with no material advantage to each team. As I recall it, Harvard made one or two touchdowns and possibly a place kick. Uh, just a minute. Possibly a place kick. Forget what the spot. And why, uh, one field goal giving them 15 points. Carlisle, on the other hand, made but one touchdown. And Jim Thorpe made the other scoring by field goals, giving Carlisle 18 points. Exactly right. Grover might know. I believe that Jim Thorpe also made the one touchdown Carlisle got that afternoon. So he must be given credit for having practically one from Harvard single-handed. Of course, as we all know, no one player can do it all. The rest of us had to lend Jim our help in uh, making the touchdown as well as the field goal. To me, it was indeed a wonderful victory for Carlisle as I, just previous to the game, and had thought maybe we might be the loser, but uh, it may have been that uh, Harvard may have been slightly overconfident 
for that game. And on the other hand, the Carlisle team was not so confident. Sometimes that makes a difference in a game of football. Awful confidence may defeat you sometime, and underconfidence gives you hope anyhow. That may have happened at this game between Harvard and Carlisle. Henry, what do you remember about Jim Thorpe as a person? What was his personality like, his character? As I have related heretofore, I first met up with Jim Thorpe when we were just young lads at Haskell Institute. We were just like other ordinary lads, playful and jovial and so on. Then later, I met up with Jim again at Carlisle during the year 1911. We were grown up then, and of course, we being teammates on the Carlisle team, we had more or less associations with each other. My personal relations with Jim Thorpe were always good. Jim was a jovial sort of man, like the kid. Some people may not believe that, but having known Jim personally, I knew that he was a jovial sort of man. And he was not uh, big-headed or anything like that. He was just an ordinary person. No bragging about him or anything. He never bragged about anything. Probably because he knew that he was gifted with a wonderful physique. Physically, he could do most anything. And I always respected Jim for his personality, behavior as far as I knew it, and we always got along just fine. I can only say that I'm very thankful that uh, I ever knew Jim Thorpe. While we were together at Carlisle, Jim never seemed to bother much about the female sex. In fact, I always thought he didn't have any sweetheart at all. That seemed to be the least thing on his mind. However, as I have said, he was a jovial sort of man and was friendly with everybody. He would joke with the girls and boys on the campus and uh, I was somewhat surprised when I heard a few years later that he had married one of our schoolmates, Ivor Miller. In our social activities at Carlisle, where they allowed dancing, I don't believe I ever saw Jim dancing with Ivor Miller, much less to visit with her in, in our social gatherings. So uh, 
I don't know. When he got married a few years later to Iva, I was a little bit surprised. And in fact, I don't know of him having any special girl there. He treated them all alike. So I guess they were all his girls, you might say. They all thought well of Jim on the campus. Of course, he was well known, possibly for his athletic prowess. Could you tell us something about your courtship with Rose and your marriage and then your first job? My football career at, at Carlisle and later on was abruptly terminated. because I got married at the Carlisle School in the early part of the year 1912. We were both students there. And my wife was a member of the Chippewa Indian tribe from the state of Wisconsin, and I from the Pawnee tribe from the state of Oklahoma. We were married on the Carlisle School campus in the superintendent's mansion on January 15, 1912. And we left immediately. As I had been offered a job in the Federal Indian Service at Wind River, Wyoming. We journeyed from Carlisle to Wind River by train, and we might say that was our honeymoon trip. We enjoyed the trip splendidly. At the time of our marriage at Carlisle, we had planned just a quiet marriage to be unknown to the school, but our superintendent at that time suggested that uh, it might be well to notify my wife's parents in Wisconsin of our contemplation, which was done and a telegram came back saying to hold up the marriage as my wife's father was coming. So that made a delay of several days in our actual marriage. In the meantime, word had gotten out on the campus of our contemplated marriage. And then, of course, the, the members of our football team got word of that and said nothing was to be done but to give us a little celebration. So the football team arranged for a banquet 
on the day of our marriage. And, of course, the news having been spread all over the campus, there were quite a number of people attending our marriage ceremony and also the banquet. Our marriage having been concluded in the afternoon, we had made arrangements to leave that evening for Wyoming. And as I was later told by the, the Carlisle student body asked our superintendent to be allowed to have a dance in honor of our marriage. So I guess they had the dance while we were on our way to the West. All in all, it was a very eventful event for us. As I say, we did not intend to make any noise about our marriage, just a quiet marriage. But I guess it was supposed to be otherwise. My wife's father have, uh, had arrived in the meantime, of course he was uh, present for all of the festivities. And I just assumed that he had uh, asked his daughter if she really wanted to get married, and I suppose she said yes, so he gave his consent. So everything went through all right. I might say that uh, just last January 15th, my wife and I celebrated our 60th wedding anniversary. As you, as you might surmise, we did not know each other very well. But through good fortune, we have stayed together as man and wife all these years and raised a family of children. Could you tell us something about your early career with the Indian Bureau? As I have stated, upon our marriage, I re received an offer of a job in the Federal Indian Service at Wind River, Wyoming. We arrived there and that was my place of employment in the Indian Agency for two Indian tribes located in that area, namely the Northern Arapaho and the Shoshone tribes of Indians. My work consisted primarily of office work, accounting, and so on. As you know, most all Indian tribes had had land consisting of Indian reservations. Some of these reservations had been uh, 
put into so-called Indian allotments for the individual Indians. And this was very interesting work in uh, the manipulation of the duties in connection therewith. Very good experience in uh, consisting of realty work. In my connection with the Federal Indian Service, that was principally my work was in connection with realty. And as I say, it was very interesting work that uh, that brought you into title work, leasing of lands, sale of lands. In fact, anything that related to real estate and you had to know the federal regulations governing such lands, both reservation and uh, allotments. We did not remain at uh, Wind River, Wyoming so long possibly a little over a year. My wife didn't seem to like the mountain area for some reason. So we moved to her home in the state of Wisconsin where I was employed in uh, an Indian agency office there. And uh, almost the same kind of work was indulged in there. And uh, we did not stay there so very long either because she complained, my wife complained that she couldn't stand the rigorous winters there. And thought possibly it'd be best to come to my homeland in Oklahoma. And that we arranged for by transfer. We located in the city of Muskogee, Oklahoma, at what was then called the Union Agency for the Five Civilized Tribes. I still followed the same kind of work. regarding realty and the accounting relative there too. I spent possibly five years there. Then from there we transferred to Pawnee, Oklahoma, my hometown. I spent five or six years at Pawnee. By that time I had spent a number of years in the Federal Indian Service and had a good idea of how the Indian affairs were administered amongst the various Indian tribes. I had a, an aching for going on the other side of the fence, you might say. I wish to work for private enterprise where I know, where I knew that uh, I would work with the white people quite a bit. I had worked mostly with Indians up to that time and I wanted to work on the other side of the fence. So. I uh, resigned at Pawnee Agency and went with the, the then Marlin Oil Company. I was assigned to Marlin's 
what was office with the Marlin Oil Company of Texas in the land and the scouting division. Spent two or three years there. Then, for some reason, the Marlin Company seemed to have folded up. And I think they discovered, discontinued most of the offices at Fort Worth. But the main headquarters of the Marlin Oil Company was still at Parker City, Oklahoma. And uh, I later learned that there was a change coming about there. That the Continental Oil Company was taking over the Marlin Oil Company in Parker City. I later came to Parker City with the, in the reorganization of the new company, the Continental, and was assigned to the Land and Scouting Department. I spent approximately 17 years with the Continental, including my short stay with them all in all, company in Texas. Then, my beloved wife wished to move to the Southwest because all our children had, were employed out, out there in New Mexico and Arizona. So, I resigned my position with the Continental at Ponca City and we moved to the Southwest. Having put in quite a stretch of time at Ponca City with the Continental, I felt like I should take a little rest. So I took about a year's vacation. Part of the time we lived in uh, in California, there with my wife's sister. Then we came back. Well, we had uh, intended to locate at Albuquerque, and we came back to Albuquerque. And uh, I, I, I was uh, seeking a job in Albuquerque as there were quite a number of uh, federal, federal services located there. Jobs were not planned for those days. And I was about to give up the idea and come back to Oklahoma. But I went to a placement officer in Albuquerque for the federal government and asked him if there were any any positions open in Albuquerque to which I could fit into. He said, I'm sorry, he said, I don't, not right now, no opening. And he says, Roberts, why don't you try Los Alamos? I says, where is Los Alamos? He says, it's up here and up here above uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico, 
it's kind of out of an out of the way place up in there, high area. I said, well, I've heard I've heard spoken of a place like that. Is that where they make the bombs? He said, yes. And I said, uh, I'd be afraid to go up there for fear. One of those bombs might explode and blow us all up. And the lady smiled and says, well, she didn't think it'd be anything like that. So I told her, well, I'll go up there and see what I can do toward uh, finding something to do. So I says, uh, now how do you get up there? He says, well, you know where Espanola is? I said, yeah, I think I do because uh, we were out in this country years ago and I remember that name. It is right near the Rio Grande River, as I recall. I said, yes. There you go out of sight of Fay, kind of going off westerly. Just follow the highway and you, you'll see the town on your opposite side of the river. Then you hit the town of Espinola. They have one main street running east and west. You just follow that street right through to almost the western edge. Then the highway forks, one to the right, one to the left. You take the left one. <coughs> you follow that highway as far as you can go. You get right up to the base. And that I did. It was quite a climb. And we approached the base. We saw a, wire, a high wall wire fence, maybe 12, 14 feet high. I could see some uniform soldiers standing there by the entrance gate. That was a restricted area at that time. And I gave up to the gate, stopped, the gate opened, and one of the soldiers, soldiers came to the car. I gave him my note. He understood. So you drive in and go to that little office and show your pass, which I did. Well, having done that, I was told then to go up, up into town there, which was two or three blocks further up the Mesa. I had to go to a certain office there to present my pass, which I did. Then I was told to wait there. Next thing, I was called to one of the many offices located at Los Alamos. I think the idea was to ascertain my qualifications for holding a position there at the base and also to see whether there was any vacancy to which I could fit into. It was several days of this processing. Each evening when I left the base, I had to surrender my pass at the entrance gate. And I was given another pass to assure my 
returned to the base the next day. It was about three days that this processing went on and finally I was told that an opening had been found for me which was in the finance division. Uh, having been assured of a position there made me very happy because I was anxious to get back into the harness after vacationing for about one year. So I, as I left the base that evening, I was told that there were no living quarters available at the base. So I'd, ha I'd have to find my own living quarters outside of the base. That I was lucky to find near the town of Espionola and also a place to board. The next morning I reported for duty at the base. And by my work began what was at that time the Manhattan Project and later on, the Atomic Energy Commission. I spent approximately five or five and a half years at Los Alamos. Then our finance division was transferred to the city of Albuquerque. so that a regional office could be created there for us. And I spent five, well, approximately six years at Albuquerque with the finance division and retired from there at the age of 70. I retired from the Atomic Energy Commission on the 1958 and returned to Pawnee, Oklahoma to make our home there. Just previously my aged father had passed on on the 10th day of March, 1958, here at Pawnee, Oklahoma. He was 98 years of age at the time of his death and was the principal or head chief of the Skeety Wolf Band of the Pawnee Trail. And I being the eldest son living, I succeeded to his title upon his death. And that title I still maintain. All right. Could you tell us something about Iva Miller Thorpe, Jim's first wife? Speaking of uh, 
Jim Thorpe's first wife, Iva Miller. I first got to know Iva at the Shalako Indian School in Oklahoma. We were students there. And I never saw her anymore until I went to Carlisle. She was a student there already. And of course, Jim was also a student there. And as I have stated before, they later got married some years after we got married at Carlisle. Ivo was a very pretty girl when I knew her at Shlaka and was still good looking when she was at Carlisle. So I guess the great athlete Jim Thorpe must have fell for her. And they got married. And I remember when they, they had that first child, which was, which was a, a boy. He was, I would judge, two or three years old. when we saw him in Muskogee, Oklahoma, about the age of our oldest son. I understand that this little lad passed away, possibly not long after they had visited us in Muskogee. Good morning. New York Giants baseball team. They were barnstorming, so to speak, throughout the country. And they came to Muskogee and put on at least two games with the local baseball team there. And while they were there at the Seavers Hotel, they came to visit us at our home at, and dined with us. We had a nice visit with them. Everything indicated they were a happy marriage couple and they were very loving to their little son. It was, I understand that it went pretty hard with Jim when he lost his little son. I recall that uh, Iva Miller, later Jim Soap's wife, had a sister who was a student at the Schlock Indian School Boys, come on, at the time Ivo was there as a student and her name was Grace Miller. I understand that Grace married somebody by the name of Morris and they worked 
by the federal government on the Oto Indian Reservation near Pawnee. Then later, I think they moved to Yale, Oklahoma. Here, uh, Mr. M Morris had severed his relations with the with the Indian Bureau who was engaged in some business in Yale. And I gather that's how come Jim Thorpe and uh, his sister and her husband moved there so they could be together. That was my guess. I don't know now. I haven't heard from uh, either sister. I don't have them for years. And May have moved to Neil, from Neil, Oklahoma to some other place, or they moved to the feast, I don't know. Anyway, we don't know anything about their whereabouts at this time.